This way, I said. Ian sprang up and followed me through the new door. What would happen if anyone tried to go through without this mark? If they didn't have the other magical passcode, the wall would rematerialize and bash them in the face. He let out a snort. Effective. If it was, which is what had made this place a favorite sort of speakeasy for the magically inclined. Having to access it by going over the falls was inconvenient, but there were other ways to get in. If I had bothered to keep in touch with my old friends from this place, we could have found out those ways and climbed down the cliffs to this entrance without needing to go over the falls and get soaked. I began to strip off my hood, rubber boots, and the rest of my wet suit as we walked deeper into the narrow passageway. Beneath it, I wore a form-fitting black velvet dress that redirected Ian's attention in a flash when he saw it. We'll start off by looking for Rufus, I said as I shook my hair out from its bun. He's an old friend of mine. My voice trailed off as the passageway ended in a large open space. The last time I'd been here, countless orbs had floated around the room, illuminating everything with their beautiful, silvery glow. It had also been filled with people, music, laughter, and magic. Now, it was as silent and empty as an abandoned tomb. I walked further into the room, the remnants of old magic touching me, like cobwebs. That was all that remained of the place I'd known. Everything else was gone. I don't understand, I whispered. Ian looked around, then inhaled deeply. Barely a hint of scent anywhere. This place hasn't seen action in a decade, at least. How long did you say it's been since you were here? Not that long, I began, then paused. Uh, I guess it had been a while. Ten years ago? Twenty? When I stayed silent, his stare grew pointed. More? A little over ninety years, I said, feeling sheepishness wash over me. Ninety, he repeated in disbelief. Why in blazes did you pick this place, then? It was the most recent magic club I'd been to, I admitted. His brows nearly flew into his hairline. Ninety years? Blimey, no wonder you're so uptight. Every senior citizen in the world has cut loose more recently than you. I stiffened. I don't appreciate the sarcasm. And I don't appreciate my balls freezing to my bishop he interrupted. Yet here we are, and since we're being honest, you've got something stuck in your teeth. What? I didn't remember eating any real food. Right between the two front ones, he said, pulling out a compact cosmetic mirror from his pocket. He must be more vain than I'd realized, bringing that with him. I'd brought weapons. See for yourself, he said, holding the compact open. I glanced at the mirror, and the dark cavern vanished while an endless array of mirrors shot up to surround me. I tried to run and more popped up, blocking my path. Incensed, I punched the nearest one. The shiny, 
reflective surface didn't even crack. Instead, more mirrors appeared until I began to feel dizzy from the endless copies of myself. Damn you, Ian! I shouted, punching another mirror. Once again, it did nothing except make my fist sore. I couldn't see him, but the laughter that rumbled into my ears was unmistakably his. I can't believe you fell for you have something in your teeth. Really, little guardian, that has to be as old as you are. I, I stopped my attempts to beat my way out of this. They only served to increase the mirrors and my own sense of disorientation. Impressive spell, I said in a tone that belied the rage coursing through me. Where did you learn it? Another laugh, sounding closer this time. From a witch who caught me and several other vampires in it. None of us could get free until the spell expired. Necromancers couldn't break it when we used it on them later. Even mentors hadn't heard of it. That's how I reckoned it should work against you. He'd actually shown me a spell I'd never seen before. I'd be impressed if I wasn't so furious. Don't congratulate yourself yet. I'm not done trying to get out of this. It sounded as if he'd settled himself into a more comfortable position. By all means, do your best, but the spell expires in three hours. If you can't find a way out by then, I win. I could buy more time by using my abilities to freeze it but I wouldn't use that power unless I had to. Until then, I had other tricks to try. By the end of the first hour, I was cursing Ian in every language I knew, although I made sure to do it in my head since vocalizing the curses only amused him. When I was well into the second hour, I'd stopped being angry. Instead, I was testing the limits of the spell with a growing sense of excitement. So far, I'd been unable to beat it. Blasting all my supernatural power at the mirrors did nothing to break them. I finally resorted to freezing time in an attempt to move around the mirrors while everything was still. It didn't work. Punching and kicking the mirrors only served to multiply them. So did stabbing them with one of the silver knives I'd hidden in my boots. In fact, the mirrors were so impervious to harm, I finally came to the conclusion that they couldn't be real. If they were, I should have been able to at least cause a hairline crack in one. The fact that I hadn't meant I probably wasn't doing any of the things I thought I was doing. For all I knew, I was still standing in the same spot I'd been when I first looked into the mirror Ian had spelled to become a trap. If so, I shouldn't be focused on trying to destroy the mirrors or get away from them. I shouldn't pay attention to them at all. Instead, I needed to focus on myself. I closed my eyes, taking in deep breaths in an attempt to center myself. It sounded like Ian shifted from his seated position. Breathing? Think you can meditate your way out of this? I ignored the amusement in his tone to focus on the more important issue, he'd noticed what I was doing. He hadn't commented on any specifics of my actions before. 
That only strengthened my suspicion that I hadn't been doing any of it. Ian would have been unable to resist mocking me for trying to beat my way through the mirrors, let alone my other efforts. I continued to focus on my breathing until through force of will, I couldn't hear Ian anymore, despite the fact that he was still talking. After several minutes, I became aware of something I'd been oblivious to since this ordeal had started. The feel of cold, hard stone beneath me. I must be on the ground. Sprawled out, judging from the chilliness against my arms, legs, and torso. I must have been like this the whole time, considering how cold my limbs felt. Oh, what a clever spell. If I could, I'd congratulate the person who'd created it. Like quicksand, the more I'd struggled to escape it, the deeper I'd sunk into it. This spell could be useful in my attempt to bring Dagon down while trying to ensure that both Ian and I survived. And if I could breathe, then I could move. If I could move, I could reach my silver knife for real this time. No matter how ancient or powerful, all spells ceased in one of three ways, when they were finished, when they were beaten, or when the bespelled person died. I, I just needed to intensify my focus first. I concentrated on my breathing until nothing else existed and nothing else mattered. Then, when I was hovering between that perfect state of complete self-awareness and complete oblivion, I reached down and pulled my silver knife from my boot. Son of a bitch. Ian's muttered curse broke through my concentration, but it was confirmation that I had succeeded in actually getting the knife this time. I trusted his reaction more than I did the feel of smooth silver in my hand. I've been fooled by my senses before with this spell. It took another few minutes before I could will myself back to where I was able to move the knife again. This time, I brought it to my chest and instantly felt an unseen force seize my hand. What the bloody hell do you think you're doing? Ian sounded as if he was snarling the words into my ear, but when I opened my eyes, I saw nothing except mirrors. I couldn't see his hand on mine, and now, I could no longer feel it, but I knew he was still gripping my wrist. What was I doing? I was making sure that I could do what was necessary to end this spell. This spell might be useful in our trap for Dagon, but the demon was far more powerful than I. If I'd figured out a way out of this, he would, too. It had taken me the better part of three hours, I didn't dare to hope it would take Dagon that long. He wasn't just more powerful than me, he was also Ian's older. For all I knew, he'd been the creator of this spell, for all magic had its origin in demons. Besides, if I did what was necessary to defeat this spell in front of Ian, he would figure out what I was. I couldn't let that happen, since I didn't want to kill Ian. Surprisingly, that wasn't out of fear for what mentors would do. No, it was Ian's devotion to his sire that had changed my mind. The kind of loyalty that looked hell in the eye and told it to do its worst because nothing would make you endanger the person you loved. That was rare. Well deserving of protection. The bruise to my ego was a small price to pay. Better to have Ian think he'd used a spell on me I couldn't defeat. Let him revel in his supposed win. It might be best to let Ian take the lead on choosing the hotspots anyway. Had it really been 90 years since I'd gone out for some fun? 
How embarrassing. And if I did strongly disagree about Ian's methods, I could wait until I was out of his eyesight, then extract myself from this spell. Ian would never even know I'd done it. Decision made, I opened my eyes, seeing only never-ending reflections of myself in the countless mirrors. You win. Come again? Ian said, sounding surprised. You win, I repeated. I can't break the spell, and my time is almost up, isn't it? Five more minutes. He still sounded much closer. Why do I have the distinct impression that you haven't truly given up? I don't know what you intended before, but you damn near stabbed yourself in the heart, so I'm not letting go of your wrist. I couldn't tell if I smiled for real or if the spell only tricked me into believing it. And you saved me. My hero. My, my arse, he responded at once. Somehow, you're playing me. I can feel it. He had good instincts. It's probably what had kept him alive when one of the underworld's most powerful demons had been after him for decades. But there was a time-tested truism on my side. Men always wanted to believe they'd won a match of wits against a woman, even if their instincts told them otherwise. How many different ways do you want to hear me say you won? I asked in a faux exasperated tone. Very well, I concede, I surrender, I hand over my sword, I wave the white flag. Enough. His voice changed. Suspicion gave way to the steel of resolve. As I've told you before, I can wait to find out what you're hiding from me, but make no mistake, I will find out. What's more, now silkiness replaced that steel, you'll tell me willingly, little guardian. It had to be the spell that caused me to feel as if his words danced along my nerve endings. Yes, that's what it was, I told myself firmly. The spell. If I had a secret as big as you're implying, I replied, I'd never share it with you. He laughed, low, sensual, and oh so enticingly confident. Now that is a wager you will lose. Count on it. Chapter 11 The entrance to our hotel had been swept clean, but the rest of Times Square was still coated with streamers, confetti and other remnants from celebrations the night before. Seeing it, I wasn't sorry we'd spent New Year's Eve over the border in Canada. Not that I had anything against confetti or streamers, it was the crushing crowds I wasn't fond of. Times Square on New Year's Eve was the epitome of that. When we exited the hotel, the bellhop offered to hail a cab for us. Ian turned to me. Up for a walk instead? Sure. My ice blue dress might be formal, but it didn't restrict my stride and since I was a vampire, I couldn't get blisters, despite today's foot-contorting high heels. Ian offered me his arm, which I took after a brief arch of my brow. Careful, someone might mistake you for a gentleman. He flashed a grin at me. Anyone who'd make such a mistake deserves what they get. His smile made his looks even more distracting, and that was quite an accomplishment. Once again, we'd gotten a suite with two bedrooms, so we'd had privacy while readying ourselves for tonight. When Ian had come out of his room with his auburn hair slicked back so his impossibly beautiful features were highlighted for maximum effect, 
wearing a tuxedo that draped his tall, muscled form as if the tailor who'd fit him for it had been in love. I'd had to look away before I did something ridiculous. Like proposition him on the spot. I don't know why I was having such a strong reaction to him. A week ago, I'd seen him naked and felt less affected. But I hadn't really seen Ian as a man then. I'd seen him as a necessary burden that might end up stabbing me in the back. Now, I knew Ian was dangerously smart, complicated, loyal, powerful, lethal, sexy, and arrogant. Proudly so. He took every second and third glance from the normally jaded New Yorkers as his due. He even flashed pitying looks at the people who abruptly turned and began to follow him, glancing at me before raising a brow at them as if to say, sorry, I'm hers tonight, and yes, that is your loss. After several instances of this, I was getting irritated. These people could clearly see my arm folded in his. Did I need to take more drastic measures to show that he was not available for their pleasure? Perhaps I'd feed from the next person who spun around and began to follow him like an animal catching an irresistible scent. Gods, I muttered out loud. What was wrong with me? Ian glanced at me. Something amiss? No, I said while thinking yes. Nearly all vampires were possessive over their personal food sources, their offspring and their lovers, yet Ian was none of those to me. I'd never turned a human into a vampire, so I couldn't speak for offspring, but I'd never experienced that trademark surge of territoriality with any of my former lovers or the humans I'd put under my protection. For the past 4,000 years, I'd been glad to find myself above such pettiness. So why was I now fantasizing about biting every male and female who had done nothing more than make their interest in Ian known? Lack of control, I decided in a grab for an excuse. I was in the very unfamiliar position of being spellbound into following Ian's lead tonight. I must be trying to distract myself from that by inventing a possessiveness I didn't really feel. Yes. That had to be it. Which act would you prefer for tonight? His questions broke through my musings. I was all too glad for the interruption. What do you mean? He shrugged. There's the new lovers act, the friends who fuck act, the swingers act, the gold digger and sugar daddy act, the fighting couple act. What about a platonic friendship act? I interrupted. He looked at me as if I'd finally spoken a language he couldn't understand. Is that a joke? Hardly. You might be attractive, but not everyone wants to have sex with you. As soon as I said it, I cringed. Did that sound as overly defensive as I felt? No. Well, some people also want to kill me, he said at once. Some want me to turn them into a vampire, some want my money, some want me for my rare artifacts, some for my fighting skills, and one wants to dangle me out as bait for a demon she's trying to kill. See? No one is with me, simply to be with me. Guilt pricked me, followed by a rush of empathy. I knew what it was like to be considered an object first and a person last. 
In fact, I couldn't remember the last time someone had been with me just to be with me either. Wait, yes, I could. Tenic. Loneliness and a far deeper wave of guilt swelled, followed as always by pain. How could I have not known what Tenic was trying to tell me the last time we were together? How could I have been so blind as to miss that he'd been saying goodbye? As much as I wanted to, I could do nothing for Tenic. But I could do something for the man next to me, if Ian allowed himself to accept it. I might be with you for ulterior reasons now, but it's well established that it's been a while since I've gone out for fun, I said in a carefully nonchalant tone. And whatever else you are, you are fun, Ian. So, assuming we're both still alive when this is over, would you accompany me for an evening out? He looked at me in amazement. Then he began to laugh. Offering me a pity date? Now I've heard everything. It's not pity, and it's not a date, I said, a testier note creeping into my tone when he continued to laugh as if I'd told the funniest joke ever. Since you've never gone out with someone just as a friend, and I'm in clear need of an update on places to have a good time, I thought, oh, never mind, if you can't stop laughing at me. My apologies, he said, still chuckling. It's only that I can't decide which is funnier, my being pitted for an assumed lack of companionship, or the look on people's faces if they saw you, a venerated law guardian, out with an infamous, law scorning Raquel like me. He was right that I'd hear no less than a decade's worth of snide remarks from some of the more sexist council members, not to mention a few from my fellow law guardians, too. But that didn't matter. Long ago, I decided I wouldn't let other people's disapproval dictate my actions, so as the saying goes, I can handle it if you can. His laughter stopped and something flashed over his face, too quick for me pinpoint what it was before it was gone. If you hadn't played a part in the execution of my friend's child, I think I would very much like you, Veritas. She's still alive. I, I couldn't say that out loud without endangering her, and I wouldn't do that, despite the surprisingly strong urge I had to redeem myself in Ian's eyes. On that awful day, I'd been close enough to the little girl to know she wasn't the real human slash vampire slash ghoul hybrid who'd been sentenced to death. She was a demon-branded shapeshifter, disguised to look like her. Thankfully, the council members and other law guardians hadn't noticed. They couldn't sense demons the way I could. When I realized the switch had been made, I knew I didn't have to freeze time to save her, which was what I'd intended. I told Ian none of that. All I said was, You'll never forgive me for her death, will you? As if there were any doubt. His calling me by my name instead of his usual moniker of Little Guardian had been enough to tell me how serious he was. No, I won't, he said in a low, steady tone. I met his eyes and held them. Good. Some things should remain unforgivable. I'd never forgive Dagon for what he'd done. Every once in a while, I still woke up screaming from the memories. Unlike the popular saying, time did not heal all wounds. In truth, I was grateful for Ian's reminder of how he saw me as another merciless player in the execution of a child whose only crime was frightening the bigoted because she'd been born different. Now, I could stop with these ridiculous thoughts and feelings about Ian. 
They were a waste of time and more importantly, a waste of energy. Nothing mattered except bringing Dagon down. Tonight was one more step toward accomplishing that. Pick whatever act you want, I said, and stared straight ahead for the rest of the walk. Central Park was bathed in a blanket of white. Lights from the surrounding buildings reflected off the snow and made it appear to glimmer. New York was the city that never slept, but at midnight at the famous park, located in the heart of the city, things appeared to be winding down. I'd been to New York City many times for business, but I couldn't remember the last time I'd strolled through Central Park. A few decades? Longer? Many things appeared new, such as the Alice in Wonderland sculpture and the ice skating rink. I had seen Belvedere Castle before, but back then, it had been in a state of disrepair. Now, the faux castle looked fully renovated. It was also the location of exhibit rooms, an observation deck, and the local weather station, according to a sign we passed. Ian took us around the main entrance of the castle, to the back side of it. There, on the rocky foundation that faced a small pond, he stopped and gave me a serious look. I've been asking your preference on things, because I don't want the spell to force you into acting against your will. But I don't trust you not to return here in your official capacity later. That's why I'm claiming one of my acts of obedience. By the spell that binds us, Veritas, I command that you will never prosecute anyone for their magical actions tonight and you will also never tell other guardians, enforcers, the council, or other law-worshipping vampires about this place. I felt the spell re responding to his words, tightening around me until they were part of me. At the same time, it was all I could do not to whoop in relief. This is what he was spending one of his acts of unquestionable obedience on, when he said, I command, I'd almost whipped out my silver knife in fear that it would be something I couldn't tolerate. But I never would have told anyone about this place. I only prosecuted people for magic when that magic harmed others. Not that the council or anyone else knew that about me. If they did, I wouldn't be a law guardian. Done, I said at once. My, my breezy tone caused his gaze to narrow, as if he just realized he might have wasted one of his commands. I smiled innocently while on the inside, I was chuckling. One down, two to go. If the rest were anything like this, I wouldn't need to bother with the effort to get out of this spell, 